Thank you for watching the Bridge Church Messages online. It's always encouraging to hear how these messages have impacted people all around the world. If you have stories that you would like to share, we'd ask that you email them to hello at bridgechurchfl.com. Also, if you'd like to support the Bridge Church financially, including this ministry that brings these messages to you online, you can click the tab at the top of the page that says Give. Today we're going to listen to a message directly out of our Life Happens series. We pray that this message affects you and impacts you in a beautiful way. Hey, for those of you that are joining us for the first time, my name is Mark, and it is great to have you guys uh, here today. Uh, we've been doing a series called Life Happens. And we've been talking about the fact that no matter how dark, no matter how bleak, no matter how hopeless or lifeless a situation looks, when somebody opens up their life to a personal relationship with Jesus and God comes into their life, literally he will put you into the life uh, path of somebody who's struggling and life can happen there because of the life that's living inside of you. And it's a powerful, powerful thing. And I just want to say, uh, as your pastor, thank you guys for the way that you have kept your heart so wide open during this whole series. Because God has done so many beautiful things because of how you understand uh, how life can happen through you. So you guys, uh, you know, bless the community in big ways. We celebrated that uh, last week. Um, because of how you guys responded to Pastor La Salette, in Swaziland um, near South Africa um, over this next coming year, 2,000 orphans are going to be eating because you guys supplied the funds to feed those kids. And God did that through you guys. And I think that's awesome. And, uh, and last week we talked about how, you know, keeping your life open to um, understanding that God has brought people into your life that kind of need to see that hope that you have and, and need to see what God looks like, what his love looks like, and so he's going to put you in their path, and, and we said, hey, if there's some people that have been heavy on your heart um, that you go, man, they could really uh, use hope, and I believe God brought me across their path so that they could find it, um, we said, write down their names, and when you put those into drop boxes, that we'd be praying for them. I came in here last night, and by the way, every one of those names I went through, and, and you guys, just to show the level of love that you've allowed God to put in you, there were 725 names that you guys submitted. And that is a beautiful thing. And, and if you're here for the first time, you might go, oh, you know what, there are people in my life like that. You just feel free to tear off that part of your bulletin, and there's a place for prayer requests. You can write the names of the people that you are praying for, that you would like us to pray for as well. And, uh, and you can begin to think about Christmas and, and bring them for the, for, uh, the Christmas services. And uh, uh, you can put those in a drop box. We'll add their name to the list, and we're going to be praying for all those people. The prayer team, uh, pastoral care, ministry team, a lot of us are going to be praying for them with you guys. So I want to take a moment. I want to pray for that 725 people. By the way, it represents much more than that because some people put, you know, my whole client base. Some people put the entire basketball team, and they named a high school. And, uh, and I just think that is awesome. And so let's pray for them. We're not going to go through all 725. We'll just kind of do, put together as a group, and uh, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for teaching us, uh, God, that your life living in us can make a difference in the lives of the people that uh, you bring into our lives. And, and so, Father, we lift up these 725-plus names because every name is a person, and every person has a story to tell. And every person whose name is listed in these prayer lists, Lord, is someone whose life you've caused our lives to intersect with in one way or another. And so, Father, we just ask that you would look at each one of those names, that you would draw those people to you, give them an awareness of how much you love them, put inside of them, Lord, even a longing to fill something that they've tried to fill with so many other things. So, Lord, that when someone says, hey, would you like to come in here about how to have hope, that they're just so ready, God, to, be, to receive that. And so, Father, we just ask for you to move in the lives of all those people. We do, we're just so grateful, God, that you find here in us a community of people who love people right where they are and are just willing to allow you to bring your love through us. God, we love you for it. We thank you, and we want you to get all the credit, all the glory. We want you to make your name famous. We want to see you do marvelous things in the lives of all these people. And, Lord, we praise you for it. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. So, uh, so way to go, guys. Keep praying. 
um, and, uh, and we're going to keep praying with you. Uh, so as today as we land this series on uh, the fact that life happens, um, you know, one of the difficulties is, is that you and I, when we open up our lives to a relationship with God, a lot of times where that, that relationship comes in and, and everything is exciting and everything's fun and everything's happening. But the problem is, is that we leak. And we don't always feel that way. We don't always sense God that way. We don't always experience life that way. And today I want to talk with you about the fuel for life. What do you do to, to be able to just continue to allow the, the life that God has put in you, that he's, of him, his presence in your life, how do you continue to stay strong in that? How do you continue to stay centered in that? And, and it's really one simple word, and the word is gratitude. And I know that for some of you, you're thinking, oh, this is so cute. It's Thanksgiving, and we're going to hear a message about gratitude. What a cute thought and idea. The pastor's going to put all that aside, okay? Because let me kind of put this in perspective for you. I don't think that there is a habit or an attitude that has the power to, to release life into your life like gratitude does. This is the thing that changes everything else in your life. A heart of gratitude and an attitude of gratitude and a habit of gratitude is the thing that changes how you pray. It changes how you read the scriptures. It changes how you relate to people. It changes how you go through difficulties and struggles in your life. Gratitude is the one thing that changes everything. This is not just a one-day Thanksgiving high-five moment. This is the thing that literally changes everything that you will experience in life. It is the most powerful attitude that you can cultivate in your life. And I want to walk uh, through uh, four laws of gratitude, four things that are unchanging, they'll always hold true, things that, that if you are open to kind of allowing God to wrap your heart and your mind around it, and you're embracing these things, I'm telling you, these become the things that change everything for us. Okay, so four laws about gratitude. Number one is this, gratitude isn't driven by your circumstances, it is driven by your heart. Gratitude is a, is a decision that you make about the kind of person that you want to be. It is a decision that you make about the kind of life that you want to live. It is not based on your circumstances, it isn't driven by your circumstances, it is driven by your heart. Let me show you this. In Luke chapter 17... The scriptures tell us this account of Jesus. It says, as Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. Now, that's significant because the Samaritans were Jewish people that intermarried, so they were considered foreigners, half-breeds, non-Jews. They were rejected. And so Jesus is at that place where you're going to find Jewish people and non-Jewish people. And it, and it says that, that as he reached the border that he entered a village there and 10 lepers stood at a distance crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. It says that they, they stood at a distance. And there's a reason for that. If you were a leper, you had the skin disease called leprosy, and, and, and you were considered to be unclean, you could not go to the temple and worship. If you were a leper, you could not come into contact with another human being. If you touched them, then they are considered unclean like you are, and they can't go to the temple until they go through a ceremony and prove that they don't have leprosy. And so what lepers would have to do is they would have to keep distance from everybody else. It was the, the ultimate illustration of what it looks like to live a life alone. And, and, and as, they, as they kept their distance, they had to do that. Because if you were talking to your friend and you were a, a normal, everyday Jew, and you turn around and you bump into a leper because you didn't know they were there, then you're unclean. And so the, the lepers had to say, unclean, if anybody got near him, unclean, unclean. They had to warn people, don't bump into me because you're going to become unclean too. So it's a horrible condition to have. And they said, have mercy on us. And it says, Jesus, he looked at them and said, Go show yourselves to the priest, which is interesting. If you are healed of leprosy, you then have to go to the priest and prove that you don't have leprosy, make the appropriate sacrifices, and then you're invited back into the temple community. 
But before Jesus says, you are healed, he tells them, you go show yourself to the priest. In other words, this is a step of faith. You obey what I tell you, and then you're going to be healed because you did what I told you to do. So he says, go show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus, shouting, praise God. And he fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. The man was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. They all shared the same issue. They all experienced the same healing. But only one of them gave thanks. Listen. Gratitude is not driven by your circumstances. It is driven by your heart. And that proves it. Now, if you went and, and, and you chased down the other nine, and you said, hey, 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 are, are, like you, are you like thankful that Jesus healed you? What do you think they'd say? Of course, yes. If you said, are you like grateful to God that, that God healed you of your leprosy? They'd say, Yes, I am so grateful that God did that. And yet only one of them actually thanked God. And Jesus was wondering, where are the other nine? And here's what you need to understand, and here's what I need to understand. That gratitude that is not expressed looks exactly the same as ingratitude. Gratitude that is not expressed looks exactly the same as ingratitude. You cannot be silent. You've got to say something. You've got to tell the, that person, thank you for what you've done in my life. Thank you for the way that God used you in my life. Because if you're silent, you can feel as thankful as you want to feel. But it looks exactly the same as in gratitude if you don't say it. And so that means that you and I, we've got some work to do. That means that you and I need to look for opportunities to express gratitude. We need to let people know. Because those things that they're doing that are a blessing, we want that reinforced. We want them to know that it matters and it makes a difference. And so you, you want to tell people. You want to be able to tell that crossing guard, hey, I don't ever have to worry about my kids on the way to school. I just want to tell you thank you because you do your job so well. It gives me peace. You want to tell that teacher, hey, thank you for that extra 15 minutes you spent with my kid. I know that they were a handful. But it really matters to me that you cared enough to take that time for them. You tell them that. You tell the people, hey, thank you for, for spending time with my students in their small group or, or with my children in children's ministry. That matters so much to me that I'm able to be here. And I know that my kids are getting guidance and direction and love. You've got to say it. And if we don't say it, it looks exactly the same as ingratitude looks. And you want to, like, go on, get a gift card to your favorite restaurant if that's what it is. But, but make sure that you're sharing it with people. And, and, and you know, just as a as, as random, random example of, you know, being specific, just random, you just say something like this. Your preaching inspires me so much. Thank you. I just, <laughs> just... To whoever in your life that would apply, just random say, but really, but really, actually I wasn't even looking for that, but really, who is it in your life that has been a blessing to you somehow? You, you, you know, you're saying thank you to them isn't a function of the circumstance. It's not driven by that. It's driven by your heart. It's a reflection of who you are and the kind of person that you want to be. So you and I need to make sure that we're telling people. We need to write the cards. We need to have the conversations. We need to be able to open up our lives to people like that and, and for it to be meaningful and specific. So gratitude isn't driven by your circumstances. There are other people that experience the same type of circumstance in what we saw, and only one actually expressed it, and God took notice. Here's the second law of gratitude. Gratitude is the attitude that fuels generosity. 
Gratitude is the attitude that fuels generosity. The mistake that people make is people think that generosity is a function of income and how much they have, and you're dead wrong. Generosity is not a function of your income and it is not a function of how much you have. It is a function of how thankful you are. That's what it's a function of. It is a function of the gratitude that you have inside of you. Let me prove this to you. Luke chapter 7 says, One of the Pharisees, who are the judgmental, religious, rule-keeping leaders of the day, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume, which could have been worth a year's wages. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. And then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. And as this is unfolding, Jesus is looking at this Pharisee whose name was Simon. And he knows what he's thinking. He can see the guy's judgmental attitude. And what the guy is thinking is, if you knew who this woman was and where she's been, you wouldn't let her touch you. And Jesus looks at Simon, this Pharisee, and he goes, you know something? Since I've been at your house, you haven't lavished the kind of love and honor on me that this woman has. And he tells us why. Look what he says. He says, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who has forgiven little shows only a little love. Her extravagant expression, her generosity is not a, driven by her income. It's not, it's not a function of her income. It is a function of the generosity that she has in her heart, her love, her understanding of what it is that Jesus has done for her. And generosity is always a function of gratitude. It is not a function of your income. I'll tell you what, I know rich people who are so afraid of the future that they're as stingy as can be. And I know people that are flat broke that everything in their life expresses generosity. Because they understand that God has given them everything they need and he is their source of abundance and provision for their entire life. And that's what gratitude does. It gives you the ability to see God that way. And it is a function, a generosity is a function of gratitude, not a function of your income. And if I were to ask you guys, hey, who would love to be more generous in their life? A lot of people would raise their hands. Probably everybody would. But what would happen is some people would go, oh, I would love to be more generous if I had more money. Oh, I would love to be more generous if I could pay my bills. Oh, I would love to be more generous if, and you fill in the blank. Because you think that generosity is a function of your income, and it's not. It's a function of your gratitude. And the way to become more generous and to practice generosity is to simply start and say, thank you, God, you give me everything I need. You take care of me. I'm your child. And you just keep bringing into my life the things that you know need to go to other people. And I'm going to be happy to do that because you are my source of abundance for everything. And that's exactly what happens when you live a life of gratitude. We're going to have an incredible opportunity uh, with our, our, our services at Christmas. Christmas at the bridge. Eight services we're going to be doing. You heard a little bit about that this morning. And, and what happens is, is most people who don't normally go to church, you know when they like to go to church at Christmas time? Christmas Eve, right? When we're doing four services. You know what generosity looks like when we practice that here? Hey, I've been at plenty of Christmas Eve services. Hey, that, that, that time of year, I know what it's all about. And rather than me take the seat of somebody who can't come in because we have too many people in here, I want to give my seat up on Christmas Eve, and I'm going to go to one of the other services because I want to create open seating at the most optimal times. That's what living a generous life looks like. It's not, oh, but I want to create this moment for my family, and nobody's going to take it away. <laughs> That's not it. It's, no, I'm so grateful, God for the way you've helped me to come to know your love and your grace, that I want other people to experience it at the time when they most want to be here. And that's generosity. 
generosity we're going to be able to practice at, at our Christmas services in a way that we've never, ever done this before. Check this out. You know, we don't take an offering in our services. We just allow God to just work in you and flow through you and just be, for you to be free in that. One of the things that we really see is the importance of understanding the vision of where God is taking us in 2016. Our connection with Pastor La Salette and with the orphans in Swaziland, whose parents have been wiped out by the AIDS epidemic over there, one of the great opportunities that we see is we've been able to already feed uh, 2,000 kids for the next year, and here's the questions we're asking. What would it take to feed 6,000? What would that be like? What would it be like to give hope to 6,000 kids? What would it be like to be able to provide education for 6,000 kids and for 6,000 kids to find hope? What would that be like? We're just investing so heavily in Swaziland that we are sending staff over to Swaziland, and it's going to be us in Swaziland there near South Africa. We're, we just feel like God is saying, there is this massive opportunity that we're able to be a part of. And just as you guys felt like awesome when I talked about how, how through your generosity we've been able to feed 2,000, what we want to do is for people who don't even know God, we want to give them the opportunity to experience what it feels like to know that they're feeding kids as well. And so what we're going to do is at the Christmas services, we're going to actually pass a bucket. But we're going to talk about what it's about. Because we realize that when people begin to experience what it feels like to be generous, there's something inside of them that comes alive. And so at Christmas, we want you to prepare your hearts for it. And we just want to go crazy in here with generosity. You know how we're going to get there? Not by looking at our paychecks. We're going to get there by thanking God for the fact that my kids have clean water to drink. My kids don't have to worry about where the next meal is coming from. My kids know that I love them and I've got them in my life. And so I want to be able to thank you, God, by providing it for kids who don't have it. And man, Christmas is going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome here. And so those are just great ways that we can express that generosity fueled by our gratitude. Here's the third law. Gratitude is the shortest path between you and God. You ever feel like disconnected from God? Like he's far away? You ever feel like you've blown it so badly that you can't even have a connection with him or feel close to him? You ever, you ever experience that? You ever wonder, what is the will of God? I don't even know where to start with the will of God in my life. Let me tell you where it starts. It starts with, thank you, God. Gratitude is the shortest path between you and God. It is the fastest connection that you can make. Take a look at, at, at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. The Apostle Paul wrote this. He said, be thankful in all circumstances, good circumstances, yeah, bad circumstances, yep, all circumstances, for this is what? God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. You go, well, how do you begin to live out God's will? Well, you start with thank you. It puts you right in it. Saying, thank you, God. God, this is a difficult situation that I'm in, but I know that somehow you're going to shape me through it. Somehow I know you're going to work this thing out. Just Help me to grow. Give me the grace to, to get through this. Lord, thank you for the blessing that you've brought in my life. God, I just want to thank you for it. I can tell you that the fastest way to make a connection with God is just by saying thank you. It says that puts you right in the will of God. Look at Psalm 100, verse 4. Ch check that one out. It says, enter his gates with what? Thanksgiving, go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. You go, but I don't feel like it. Things are difficult right now. Or I feel like I'm such a failure. I feel so inadequate. He's like, would you put all that aside? I've opened up the gates for you. All you have to do is say thank you. That's it. Don't grovel. Don't beat yourself up. Don't crawl like a worm. Just say thank you, God, that you never closed the gates on me. Thank you that you never stop loving me. Thank you that you never give up on me. Thank you that you always are ready and willing to forgive me. You're always ready and willing to help me grow. Thank you, God, you never close the gates on me. I just praise you because you're so good. Thank you, God. And he says that's all you need to do. When you feel far away from God, the fastest way to make a connection is to say thank you. And he's like, you're in 
Gates have been opened. Way to go. All right? It's the shortest distance. If you feel far away from God, just start by giving thanks, no matter what you're going through. Fourth thing, this is huge, 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 huge. Gratitude today is the key to being able to see a better future. Now, in some of your minds, you may have read it this way. Gratitude today is the key to being able to see a better future tomorrow, which is redundant, but it sounds good. The fact is, is when you are in the situation that you're in, when it's a challenging, painful, difficult situation, you can become overwhelmed by the problem, can't you? You can be overwhelmed by the lack of income. You can be overwhelmed by the diagnosis. You can be overwhelmed by the broken relationship or by that person in your life who's just really get, causing you problems. And when the more you get focused and fixated on the problem, the less you're able to see a better future. What happens is when we become fixated on our problems, what we think is, is this. Oh, when is the next bad thing coming? Right? And you actually have a filter now where you cannot see a better future because you're so preoccupied with what is going wrong. The secret is to give thanks, whatever you're going through, to give thanks there. If you can learn to give thanks and to begin to see whatever good God can work or God can bring in your situation now, you will have the ability to see a better future. It's that simple. You literally empower yourself to be able to see what it is that God can bring in your life, the good that he can bring into your life through this. And this is huge. And so here's, here's a, a perfect example of it. The Apostle Paul, he's going off to Rome as a prisoner because he's made an appeal that if he's going to stand trial, he's going to stand trial before Caesar. And they're like, we were going to let you go, but okay, you're still a prisoner then, and we're going to let you stand trial. And so uh, the, the Romans take Paul and other prisoners, they put them on a ship, and they get to Crete, and the, and the storm is already kicking up. And Paul goes, hey, guys, not a good idea. We need to stay in Crete. They ignore what he says. And as they continue to go, they end up in a full-on gale storm. So strong that they run ropes underneath the ship to try to keep it from breaking apart. They take cargo. They throw it overboard. This storm rages for so long, for eight days. People aren't eating. They're consumed with fear. They think that they're doomed. Nobody is, is able to be able to, to look forward to the future because they're completely consumed by the situation that they're in. And the Apostle Paul, the one who said, give thanks in all circumstances, is perfectly positioned to see and hear from God. And God reveals this to him. Paul, everybody's going to make it. The ship is going to get wrecked, but not a single person is going to die if they do what you say. And as the storm is raging, the, the, some of the, the uh, sailors go, you know what, we need to get in those lifeboats. And Paul says, cut those lifeboats free because if they leave the ship, then people are going to die. And so they cut the lifeboats free. And now they're just letting this gale force wind drive them towards destruction. And, and Paul looks at everybody and he says, don't be afraid. God has revealed to me that not a single hair on your head is going to perish. The ship is going to get wrecked. But you're going to be okay and you're going to make it. And then it says, then he took some bread and gave thanks to God before them all and broke off a piece of bread and ate it. He's like, God, thank you that you provide for us. Thank you, God, that you have a future for us. Thank you. And he's like, you guys ought to eat because you've got a lot to look forward to. And you're not going to die. And it says that because that when he gave thanks before them all and he ate it, look at verse 36. Then everyone was what? Encouraged. They could now see hope. And they began to eat. All 276 of us who were on board. When you give thanks to God, it opens up your eyes to be able to see the better future. And when you do it in front of other people, they look at your circumstance and they go, this doesn't make sense. You're in the middle of a storm, man. And you go, no, I'm just thanking God because I've got something to look forward to. Then they get encouragement when they see your life. 
Now, most people live our li their lives and look at their situations as, you know, either optimists or pessimists. We talk about, you know, the glass being half empty or the glass being half full. And, and I don't know how many of you would say you're an optimist. How many of you say, I'm, I tend to be an optimist. I see the glass as half full, right? And you see and then, and then anybody say, now, nobody, nobody who's a pessimist ever says they're a pessimist. They say, I'm a realist, right? Right? How many of you say, no, I'm a realist. I see the glass is half empty. Okay. All right. Well, there are actually more categories than that. Okay. So the optimist says the glass is half full. The pessimist says the glass is half empty. The worrier frets that the water will evaporate before morning. <laughs> the entitled person asks why they don't have their own glass. The religious person is angry that somebody took the snowflake off the glass. <laughs> Keep those cards and letters coming, folks. <laughs> the, the psychiatrist says it's not what's in the glass that makes it half empty or half full. It's what's inside of you that does. The person who has obsessive compulsive disorder says, I didn't even know there was water in the glass. I just saw that the glass was dirty. The person who has ADD says, well, the glass is half, look, a squirrel. <laughs> and the science teacher solves it perfectly and says that the glass is not empty at all. It is, not, it is half filled with water and half filled with air. It is completely full. And see, I'm with the scientist, and here's why. Because as a follower of Jesus Christ, I am able to know what is true, even if I can't see it with my eyes. And when I look at somebody's situation, and when you look at somebody's situation, and the life of God is living in you, and God has changed your life, it is impossible to look at a situation and not see it as completely full. It is impossible to look at a situation and say, there's not enough in that glass, there's no hope. Because a person who, who carries the life of Jesus in them sees that space that nobody else sees and goes, no, that's all opportunity and that's all potential. And that's all space that God fills and that's where God does his most beautiful work is where it looks like there's nothing there and nothing to hang on to. That's what I see. And a person who lives with Jesus Christ li living inside of them knows that when they go into any situation and they come across somebody who feels like there's no hope, who says, my glass is completely empty, you say, no, no, you are just a miracle waiting to happen. And you might not be able to see it, but I know what is true. And what I know is true is, is that God does his best work in a situation like yours. And so I can believe for you what God can do in your life life. Gratitude gives you the ability to see a future that other people can't because you're able to thank him for what's happening now knowing that there's something better that he can create and a glass is completely full all the time. That's what it means. That's what it means when we say life happens. About a year ago About a year ago to this week, I got a call from a good friend, Tom Knowles from New Jersey. Tom is a snowbird and just has poured out his heart into this place so much. And he goes, hey, I'm in the hospital. I've got stage four cancer and it's everywhere in my body. But Tom didn't sound sad. I'm like, so what are you gonna do, Tom? And he's like, oh, he says, I've been having the time of my life. He said, what I do is, is I tell every nurse and I tell every doctor, look, no matter what happens, I win. And he's like, you see, if, if God heals me now, I'm going to get up out of this hospital bed and I'm going to walk out of this hospital on my own strength and I win. And if you carry me out of here in a pine box, God is going to raise me from the dead and I get to live forever. I win. I can't lose. No matter what happens, I win. You see, Tom could only see the glass as completely full because he has Jesus Christ living inside of him. And if you've got Jesus Christ living inside of you, the glass is always full and you win no matter what. 
And when God brings you across somebody whose life is so broken that they don't feel like there's any hope at all, it's you who are able to carry the life of God into that situation and go, I just see potential and opportunity. That's all I see. And to be able to encourage them. And through your gratitude to God right there, it just begins to give people the ability to see something that they haven't seen. Many of you are in a situation where you feel like your life is a storm. And you feel like I'm headed for a shipwreck. It's just, you, you know, fear has, has kind of taken over. And this morning, this is the time to, say, to start to say, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. God, thank you for this trial and this difficulty. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in my life. Thank you that the gates are open. Thank you that you love me. Thank you that you don't change your mind. Thank you that you're shaping me. Thank you, God, that you are at work. You know my circumstance. God, thank you. Thank you, God. And the more you do that, the more you do that, the more life you feel, the more hope rises up inside of you the more vision you're able to give to somebody else who looks and goes, that doesn't make sense to me. And you're able to say, well, how can I not have hope? No matter what happens, I win. Because Jesus is my Savior. And he's my God. And I'm trusting him. And for many of you that are in that storm, you're in that place where you just feel like, Man, I need to begin to give thanks. I just want to pray for you. Because, you know, heading into this season, Christmas, and man, what we want is we want Jesus to shine through us as a community of people. We want people's lives to be touched and and changed. We want people to find hope. And it's going to happen. But it starts with us. The most powerful thing we can do as a community is to start just by saying, thank you, God for what you're going to do. Let's pray right now. Thank you, God, for what you're going to do. Lord, in the lives of people all around us, God, people that from, we've known from business, people from school, people that we do hobbies with, just the people that you've brought into our lives, God, we just thank you. And we thank you, God, even for the difficulties and the trials and the struggles that are in our lives because it's through that that you're able to shine through the simplicity of us saying, thank you, God, we trust you. And God, as we hand bread to the people around us, it lets them know that there's a good future waiting for them. And through our gratitude, we're able to have the eyes to see it. So God, right now, we just say thank you for all the circumstances that we're experiencing. We say thank you for all the children that are gonna be blessed in massive ways through Christmas. We thank you in advance for all the people that are going to be invited, that are going to have within them a desire to actually be in church. They're going to have their hearts open and longing for you because you've already been drawing them to you. Thank you, God, for all the beautiful things that we have to look forward to because of who you are and what you do. God, thank you so much. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen, guys. Thank you so much.